Hi, I'm Sam. And I'm Max. I'm Chris. He is Chris. Welcome, <laughs> he is indeed. Welcome to this one. <laughs> wow. <laughs> like it. I know. That's what we're going to talk about. This <laughs> is Movies Actually, where we'll give you an honest review of the movies we've meddled with so mischievously over on Maybe Movies. And this time, we're talking about... The Count of Monte Cristo, the 1934 film directed by Roland V. Lee, starring Robert Dumont, Dunat, sorry, and Elisa Landai in the main roles. This is the model for how most of the subsequent movies about The Count of Monte Cristo kind of follow in the footsteps of this one. In terms of when I saw it, this one's nice and easy, I saw it for the show. I kind of grew up, not surprisingly, with the 70s. Count of Monte Cristo with Richard Chamberlain, and then the 2002 one with Jim Caviezel, Guy Pearce. Henry Cavill? Henry Cavill, yes. Yeah, and, and, um, really? Oh, yeah, I yeah. believe so. Who plays Albert? Ah! Uh, Richard Harris, of course, as well, as yes. the Abbey Fair. But so, we only got to see this one when we did it on the show, because this was our March 2022 matchup with Viva Vendetta. Yeah, and because this one appears in the film. I remember you suggested that we should, if we're going to do them, it should be the thirty-four version. Yeah, I, I mean, that's the thing for me. I I'm the same that I only saw it for the show, mm -hmm. but the reason I saw it was that it was associated with V for Vendetta. It was the version that V watches in the film, and that's why I picked that one. Having watched it, my favorite film, The Count of Monte Cristo. With Robert Donat as Edmund Dantes. I'd like to see some of the other ones to see how they play out. If you do, they are all, all of them, including the 2002 one, you can get for free on YouTube. Oh, right. Okay. Well, that's amazing. I should look them up. That's where my introduction begins and ends. I chose it specifically because it was the one referenced in V for Vendetta. But it's a good one as well because it really kind of leads into this whole kind of thing that we do with Maybe Movies is that we have the entirety of cinema to play with. What we do. So being able to jump back into some of these old black and white films is, is wonderful. What about for yourself, Chris? When did... Because obviously you were with us for this one when we did it. And when did you... Had you seen this version before? No, not before. I think you guys recommended me to watch it. And I was like, okay, I'm going to... I'm not been aware of that version. So there's about four versions. Is that right? Well, actually, no, because I looked this up. There's not. This isn't even, even the first version. Oh, good Lord, no. There were two silent versions, one made in 1912, one made in 1913, and the French made a mini-series, like a serial of it, in 1918. God. I'm gobsmacked, <laughs> really. Obviously a very popular choice. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Although apparently this version, there are only seven words in the entire film that were spoken by Edmund Dantes in the book. Mm -hmm because the scriptwriter had never read the book. Um, the director, when he, when he brought him on board, literally played it out for him. And he he just wrote down pretty much what the director was So he just wrote the script based around the skeleton of the plot? Yes. Oh, uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> but again, very briefly speaking about the director, they, I mean, talk about, I know you were saying earlier about the p people back then in Hollywood being kind of busy. Yes. So originally he was a silent screen actor. He made 12 films between 1917 and 1920. And then as a director between 1920 and 1945, directed 58 films, mm. of which he directed and wrote about a dozen of them, directed and produced about nine of them, and wrote, directed and produced about two or three of them as well. That's just incredible. <laughs> That's just incredible. Including the sequel, um, Son of Monte Cristo. What people used to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, it, it, sometimes I get the feeling that there are more old films than there are new films. Oh, yeah. And learning those kinds of facts about the productive qualities of the people working back then. I mean, some of them must have been making movies within 10 days or something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's just incredible. Oh, which again, it, you know, there's a... A mine of films there that, you know, they're the films that people should be remaking, not mm. stuff from 10, 15 years ago. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Lewis Calhoun, I like him in that film. In this film, basically, yes. what I'm talking about. Because he's in Duck Soup, it's one of my favourite comedy films of, of all time. Of course he is, yes, that. yeah. Which one is he? Um, De Villefort. 
Ah, uh, yeah. right. So oh, okay. He plays the uh, president of Fredonia. That's it. Yes. Or, or, or Duck, the, that's uh, that's the Mark, Mark's, Mark's, Mark's brothers. brothers. Yeah. Mark's brothers. Ah, right. Okay, that's how yeah. I knew him from that, and that's what made me want to watch this version. What kept me going? So I was like, oh, he's a good actor. Please be seated. Right, gentlemen, gentlemen. <laughs> yes, yes. Well remembered. We, Thank forgot, you. we forgot about him. Of course, yes. Doxy. Yes. Wherever you are. <laughs> yes. I probably we should start at the beginning. Who wants to have a shot at what the plot is? So uh, this is um, uh, again Alex Dumas' um, master, one of his masterpieces. He had so many about Edmund Dantes, a uh, first mate on uh, on a, a merchant navy vessel for um, the Kingdom of France. His captain is a. Um, support of Napoleon and arranges to have a layover on Elba where Napoleon is imprisoned uh, to carry a letter to Napoleon's followers in France. The captain dies en route and entrusts the letter to Dantes who doesn't know the contents and when he arrives back in France a trio of supposed friends conspire to have him imprisoned in the Chateau d'If without trial for a crime he hasn't committed and from there this chart, the film itself charts his uh, return to the world uh, to exact his just revenge. Yes, that sounds about about right. Yep, well yeah. done. <laughs> I have watched this film many times. As I said, I grew up with the seventies one. I, I love the story. I should really get around to reading the book at some point because uh, apparently none of the films have ever got it right. There's in all of them characters that are missing. I think the 70s one is the nearest how the story ends. Uh-huh. Is the closest to the book. I mean, even for this, there's stuff in this that doesn't appear in the book, like the sword fight, the court scene. None of that is from the book. Oh. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, that's all in, been invented for the movies. Oh, it's, it's, so you should really better read the book then. Yeah. I oh, think I'm getting... Oh, do you think? Yeah. I think you should. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I think you should. <laughs> All right, all right. Do it after this. <laughs> that sounds like that needs to go on the list, mate. I think it does. Then okay, that's I'll I'll find it in a bit. Have you seen the book? It's huge. One to read over the summer. Yes. Yeah. Again, I mean, you. I'll be surprised if you hadn't heard of it. If you haven't, you know, seen something involving it. It's been done so many times. There was a series in the eighties, I think, or the nineties, with Gerard Depardieu. Oh, that was done about it. It's it's one that people come back to all the time because oh, okay. it is a classic story of good triumphing over evil. Yep, that makes sense. It's hard to, though to say with so many different versions of it which one's the best. I mean, I know you guys. I don't know if you've seen the. I know you've oh. definitely seen the two thousand and two one, haven't you? Yeah, that's probably the one I'm more related to because that came out at the same time when I was like really grown into loving films. Mm. So that was like the one for me, I guess. But yeah. And plus, I like. Is it called, um, Guy Pierce? Guy Pierce. Yes. He's called in that film. He is called in that film, yes. Oh, what? So he's. Uh, Guy Pierce is in Dante? No, he's, he's, he's Mondego, um, Jim Caviezel. Uh, Jesus. Yes. Jesus is, is Dante. He's Dante, yeah. Okay, all right, okay. Oh, okay. Right. So, well, I mean, yeah, Guy Pierce can do a good, 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 bad guy. He does. He does a lot. Yeah. Let's be honest, I've seen a few of them. I mean, so even the 70s one, well, again, Richard Chamberlain is Evan Dantes and Tony Curtis is Mondego. Mm. Mm. I definitely should look at some of the other versions, yeah. I think. Yeah, they, they are definitely worth a look. But this one in particular, it's also really good um, watching it because I know, well, Tony, you were saying, we you might want to talk about it a bit more, about the style of these old films. You're talking about that. Well, yes, because um, especially at least into the early 50s, so much of the classical, what we think of as classical black and white filmmaking was really based off of stage plays. Mm -hmm. And so the framing, you notice the camera doesn't move nearly as much in those older movies. There are very few tracking shots or even zoom shots or anything like that. It's mostly static cameras that might sway from one side to the other is mostly what it's done and it's very clearly based on classic theatre staging it's Inter- interesting yeah, yeah. So, sorry no, no I could come on. Uh, interesting you say that because again the only sort of real tracking shot that when you said that it made me think of is just before they start the duel and there's there's the um, the dolly shot away from them yeah yeah. yeah 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 and that's like it's noticeable because it's one of the few in the film exactly exactly you know but even little things like the, you've got like these kind of really nice holdovers from from the silent films where they will put all the exposition on, on the screen for you rather than trying to fit it into the narrative 
which was really nice as well. Yeah, because in modern times they would have shoehorned that into really bad exposition yeah. dialogue. A lot of editing and things like that. Yeah. Which has worked really nice, especially with the passage of time stuff. Sometimes It's like the this. classic Star Wars scroll. Sometimes... Sometimes just a little bit of text can save you so much trouble mm -hmm. as a scriptwriter, as a storyteller. You know, sometimes you can just tell people something and then move on and get on with the action, and that's okay. Yeah. That is okay, and that, this is a great example of that. Again, I think you were saying as well, that again, so much of this story is, and again, the way it's presented in this version, it, it's about those interrelationships of the characters, the plot itself. While it's always there, it's not the focus. The focus is how the characters within the story relate. And it's one of those things, it's really weird, because we like to think that the world has changed so much in the last few hundred years, and stuff like that. But when you look at the story, this is the story of a man whose reputation gets trashed, and he literally gets cancelled for 20 years, mm. and then comes back and reinvents himself, and uses his reputation to destroy the reputation of the people that cancelled him. And in that context, we've changed very little as a society. Absolutely. You just simply replaced class privilege with wealth privilege. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Or, you which know, kind of amounts to the same thing. Yes, you know. yeah, which kind of amounts to the same thing, I suppose. It's weird that it's such a classic and an old story, but so many of the things that happen to it could happen now mm. in our world. Yeah. You know, Definitely. so easily. Yeah, yeah. Which is why, again, it is a timeless classic. If you've never seen it, it's definitely worth your time. I mean, it was one of the top grossing films of 1934. It took approximately 1.5 million at the box office. Yeah, so the top grossing film for 1934 was Cleopatra, which took 1.929. Mm. Okay, so yes, well-performing film of its time. Yes. Again, it was so popular, as I mentioned earlier, that, that almost... At the time that it came out, it, it proved so popular that they went straight into pre-production for the sequel, Son of Monte Cristo, with, oh. the, with the same director, but it took them a few years to get it finished. It almost makes you wonder if they were trying to do the same thing they were doing with the Universal Monsters. Because yeah. Dracula was 1931. Oh, yes, it was, yeah, yeah. You know, so they'd already started to do some of their sequels, and I'm just wondering if they thought they could do the same thing with this, like stretch it out into a franchise. What's a Monte Cristo verse? Yeah. <laughs> How weird would that have been? I don't know. <laughs> well, they did, this, they did a trilogy. I think it was a, a, a good 10 years after they did the sequel, they did The Return of Monte Cristo sometime in the 40s. But I don't, that was with a different production team. I don't know much about that one. You see, they could have made a Damas universe. They could have had like the same people playing the Four Musketeers and the Man in the Iron Mask <laughs> and then moving up to the Count of Monte Cristo and move through them historically like a yeah. universal timeline. They kind of, Well, I, I don't know if it... I, again, I don't know if it's accurate or not because I know... Because you've got the Three Musketeers... But when he did the uh, the Man in the Iron Mask, mm. and when Man in the Iron, Iron Mask escapes, as far as I remember as well, from the Chateau Deep, I think it's supposed to be the Chateau Deep as well. Well, then that's but that's the person, universe. That's 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 a literary universe. But isn't yeah, it? but the person who trains him to replace Louis, yeah, is an older D'Artagnan. <laughs> it's supposed to be after the rest of the Musketeers have gone, and D'Artagnan is now captain of the guard. It's in his later years he trains Prince Philippe. To replace Louis. Why don't you start writing these and make them set out as trilogies and make them more connected? Do like an Alexandre Dumas <laughs> trilogy. <laughs> what, for maybe movies? No, no just make them. You mean? Yeah. You do it. You know, you write it. Okay, you, I'll write it. You'll you direct it. Make it. You'll direct, you have to direct it. I'll try to. You can appreciate what's going on there and you can see where the connections, like, where it would be made in our modern times, oh, okay. the connections would be made. You could kind of retell the stories, but as a joined-up universe... Mike Flanagan, I'm coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. If I have the time, possibly. <laughs> but yes, uh, do go and check this one out. It is definitely worth it just to see, uh, not, so much, not even so much just because of the story, but how almost a cinematic dynasty, if you like, because as I said, almost every other film about... Monte Cristo is in some shape or form modelled on this one. So in that respect, it is worth checking out. I don't know about you guys. For me, it's definitely two thumbs. 
Yeah, two thumbs. You yeah, think yeah. two thumbs? A tentative two thumbs? It's not obviously. It's not you know like some of the other ones. Are you? I mean, you don't have to. You give it what rating you. I like. just like the pattern, so that's what I want to do right now. <laughs> I mean, with the caveat of I'm a lover of classic films, so I'm going to appreciate it. But you know, if you if you care to look at old films and see how the cinematic world has progressed, this is a great starting point. Definitely. Well, while you guys are here, mm. I best get in the kitchen. And get us some eggy in a basket. Oh, eggy in a basket. I'll get my mask out. <laughs> Until next time, guys, thank you for joining us. Please do all the usual. Please do like, share, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to be kept apprised of upcoming content. And thank you, Chris, for joining us. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And as always, guys, TTFA. Hey! You get your own couch. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <Hugs>. <laughs>